everyone. Welcome. This is an important uh, time for our research group, uh, the research group in science education, which we also like to call the Posse. And the, uh, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's, uh, uh, it starts with the academic year. We have students who come to us in September, and their task is to write a peer-reviewed research journal article during uh, the academic year. So our posse members have been diligently working on their tasks and are at the point of presenting uh, their findings today. Um, there was one important change we made or improvement in the posse. We paired the, uh, our two fabulous uh, postdocs, Chen Chen and Jackie Doyle, with our posse members and this uh, worked out really well. Uh, and I think uh, you're going to see that the results will speak for themselves. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over to, to Chen, who has double duty here. He will talk about the data set because, interestingly enough, all the presentations are about one data set. So people don't have to talk about it five times. It, uh, Chen will talk about it, and then he will guide us through the program. Thank you. And another round of applause for the postdoc. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, give you an overview of the data set in about five minutes uh, so that the rest of the presenters don't have to spend too much time on it. Right? So uh, the, the, the project is called How Pre-College Informal Activities Influence Female Participation in STEM Careers. Uh, it's a long title. Uh, within our small group, we like to call it FROST. But uh, in like publications, we don't use that anymore. Um, so what well, this project is really motivated uh, uh, by a couple of things. Most importantly, we are trying to understand what are the informal learning activities out there that uh, students nowadays uh, were experiencing or exposed to, and what what are their uh, STEM learning interests and STEM career interests look like, and how does these interests change over time from uh, middle school to the beginning of college, and if any of these interesting variables have a gender difference. Um, so the key method is uh, is a retrospective uh, study that uh, this department like to use. We uh, administer the survey in uh, college classrooms. Those are compulsory English classes, so we can uh, get as many and as diverse a population as possible. And uh, we very carefully collected uh, a national representative sample from uh, about uh, 119. Uh, higher education institutes with uh, 15,000 uh, participants, right? So I'm going to go through some of the variables that many of us are using. Uh, first, career interest. By simply answering in a long list, I skipped a lot. Uh, there's about 20 each of them. Uh, 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 the career interest, they were interested in pursuing in, from beginning middle school, beginning high school, end of high school, beginning of first semester of college, right? And then we we have or different presenters will have different ways to categorize them. Some dichotomize them, some put them to three, or four categories, right? Um, and we measure their STEM learning interests by asking them if they were interested at all or extremely interested in any of a list of STEM subjects. Uh, we asked them about their STEM identity, a very common construct we, uh, we use here, is if they see themselves as a STEM person, and if their friends, their family, their teacher, and their all of school teachers see them as a STEM person, right? And uh, we also measure a long list of goal endorsement, uh, like, uh, if making money or if, if helping others is important for your career choices. So after a factor analysis, they, uh, they uh, 
uh, can be grouped into four factors. They are external reward goal, communal goal, intellectual goal, and the free time. But different presenters may call them differently, that's, but you will get it. Uh, we measure their course taking experience, uh, if and in which level uh, they have taken any of a long list of courses. Right? Uh, we measure their informal learning experience, such as uh, if they read science fiction, watch TV, uh, playing computer games. Uh, this is just an example of them, but there is uh, one, uh, one whole page of them they, they can choose from. Right? And lastly, we have many, many uh, background information. We call them the usual suspects, such as gender, race, age, parent, education, SAT score, and such and such. So this is just to give you a glimpse of the measurement we have. Uh, and without further ado, let me introduce the first presenter, who is going to be Stephanie Harjo. Uh, so Stephanie is a master candidate in technology innovation education at Harvard Graduate School of Education. She had a bachelor degree in economics from National University of Singapore. She worked in Japan for a while, and then she had her own startup company. Uh, in, uh, in uh, 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 sorry, in Indonesia, and today <laughs> she's in Brazil. <laughs> and <laughs> so, it just give you the idea that she's all over the world, uh, and that is the reason that I am going to uh, present on her behalf, because we we kind of work on this together, um, so I know pretty well about this study. Right, and it's, it's, a, it's an interesting study. So, so she focused on the role of media in influencing student STEM learning and career interests. Right, probably you, you will already find this construct familiar because I have explained you know, the, the variables. And um, just give you some background context that a lot of money and attention and hype have put into creating a useful media content to encourage uh, students uh, to pursue a, s a science interest or science career, right? But uh, uh, what we uh, what we already know is that some of them are pretty useful, are very positive. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, technology media has been enormous has an enormous reach among children and adolescents nowadays and they can affect the adolescent's identity and value and the career aspiration. And, uh, uh, well, they, they also have the potential to, uh, to channel uh, uh, adolescent's interest in uh, STEM. So, uh, built upon this literature, we want to ask, what that, does past technology and digital media exposure have any effect in influencing students' career interest? First is career interest. Second, if it has effect on students' learning interests. And if there is such an interest, uh, are media uh, directly or indirectly uh, affecting their interest, uh, uh, perhaps through some intermediate variables that we're going to see very soon, right? So here's research design. We asked about their uh, career interest, same thing. And Stephanie dichotomized them into STEM or non-STEM. Uh, learning interest. Uh, media exposure from uh, actual curriculum activities that if they read fiction, watch STEM-related TV, watch on online STEM video, playing uh, STEM computer games. Uh, uh, STEM identity, if they see and uh, if anyone uh, in their family or friends see them as a STEM person. Self-efficacy, if they are confident in their ability to learn STEM. And the uh, personal value system, uh, I call them the external reward, uh, uh, communal, uh, or but, uh, Stephanie called them differently, but the ideas are the same. Uh, 
So we also control for a lot of covariates, such as their college year, the gender, race, and parent education. Okay. And uh, in terms of analysis, uh, she carried out a regression analysis first, and then uh, we uh, complexify the analysis, uh, moving it to a structural, structural equation modeling approach. Right. So first, in the regression model, in the first regression model, we're trying to predict uh, career interest, and we found both, uh, we found a positive uh, predictors such as STEM TV watching, online video watching, and video games playing. They are uh, positive and significant, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. They are, they are negative, <laughs> they are negative. So watch a lot of TV, play a lot of games actually have a negative effect on their uh, uh, STEM career interest. And uh, interestingly, after we controlling for this uh, self-efficacy, self-development identity variable, like this one, uh, uh, the effect of these media activities fluctuate a lot. That suggests that maybe some of these uh, 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 covariates here are actually intermediate variables that, me that, that give us a mediation effect. So that's why, uh, that's what motivates to explore using a uh, structural equation model approach later on. Right? And in our second regression, we predict the learning interest and we found both positive and uh, uh, negative uh, pr 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 factors. Positive factors including science fiction, and STEM, TV, online video, and video game uh, experiences in, or exposures. And, and the negative uh, factors including STEM app playing and creating STEM programs and contents. So that's uh, kind of counterintuitive that we wouldn't think these to be negative predictors, but we can discuss about later on. Right. So, this is uh, the, our final model with the past analysis in that uh, we, we want to see if media exposure directly have an effect on learning interests and career interests or this effect have to go through uh, some of these intermediate variables such as identity, self-development value, free time, uh, material value, and interpersonal values. Right. And what we find is kind of interesting is that uh, media exposure only have a direct effect on learning interest. So this is solid line, meaning this is significant. But it does not have a direct effect, right? If, remember, when in the regression, we see a direct effect. But uh, before we're controlling a lot of these intermediate variables, but after we're controlling them, this direct effect diminished. and nearly all of the effect have to go through these intermediate variables and uh, the width of the path corresponding to the, the effect, like the effect sizes. And uh, one message I want you to bring home about is that it's really identity that is driving the, the effect from media exposure to learning and career interest. It explains more than 90% of the effects. So, so basically we can, for now, we can kind of ignore all of these uh, complex paths, but just look at this, this very wide line. So what, what, what is this saying is that, is that, actually I will just skip to the implication, is that we should really when we talk about how media may have effect on our STEM learning or career interest, we, we really need to think about how it, sh it shape our STEM identity and in turn uh, give us a positive boost in, to, to STEM interest. Uh, so by just exposing uh, kids to a lot of uh, media and technology might not necessarily have a direct uh, encourage to them. Now, we need to think about how we can uh, help them to develop a STEM identity in like uh, media technology activities and use this STEM acti uh, identity as a catalyst uh, uh, to help them you know, bridge 
what they see on media and what they want to become in the future. Uh, so, thank you very much. And I think we have uh, time for one question. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, just to let you know that well, the plan is after each presenter, we have probably time for one question, and then after uh, we finish everything, we we have pizza, we have more questions. Right. Yeah. What? Oh, I just wanted uh, you to say a little bit more about how you parse media exposure, because right. I can see two parts to that. If yeah. I'm already interested and have a, a STEM identity, yeah. then I'm going to certainly watch Novas, and so that's going to be something oh. that I check off on there. Right? Yes. Whereas it. if yeah. I don't necessarily, and I look at something like uh, uh, Black Panther, a movie that shows yeah. the, the good guys uh, as scientists yeah. and, and the scientific civilization, yeah. then I might not have been interested, but I, I'm going to be. So there's something about seeking out media is different from being exposed to media. Yeah. And I just wondered if there's anything in the study that allows you to distinguish well, between well, them. Well, yes and no. Uh, what we could do is that we actually, in this model, we have controls for their uh, high school uh, career and learning interest. Yeah. So we know that in the beginning of high school, uh, some of the students are interested, in, so we control for that variable, and then we look at uh, if they watch a lot of uh, uh, the media uh, during high school. So that kind of helps. But, we, but, but what we do not know if it is a, like self-seeking or it was like a passive exposure. Like we do not know who assigned this uh, content to them or if they are like just uh, actively engaged in these contents. Alright, so next we have Jenny Norman. Uh, yeah. Please come and get your things ready. And uh, so, uh, Jenny is a current uh, master candidate at Harvard Graduate School of Education. And uh, she teaches and designs curriculum in high school biology classes. Uh, Jenny is the founder of STEM Telling, uh, interactive STEM teaching and learning experience that connects STEM to a student's daily -day life interest. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Can you tell my teacher? <laughs> um, so my name is Jenny Norman, and I'll be presenting our research today on I am who you see me as, reflected identity and career interest in STEM. So I've been teaching high school biology for the last three years, and I've always been interested in the kind of perceptions that I have of my students and how those perceptions might influence their career choice, especially when um, going into STEM or not going into STEM. I've also been interested on the other kind of influencers within student lives, like family, friends, or family out of school teachers and friends. Uh, we know from previous research that a student's STEM identity is built on their interests, performance competence beliefs, and recognition beliefs, and they all make up a person's STEM identity. And the highest those interests and beliefs are, the stronger the identity is, and the greater association with them going into a STEM career. In this study, we are looking at specific um, measures of recognition beliefs, which we have named reflected identities. The reflected identities come from questions on the Frost survey that Shen briefly talked about of, my family sees me as a STEM person, my friends see me as a STEM person, my in-school teachers see me as a STEM person, and my out-of-school teachers see me as a STEM person. These are all co-varying identities, and they're all facets of recognition beliefs. Reflected identities are models that you build based on others' reactions to you describing how they think. We're looking at the effect that these reflected identities have on a student's interest in pursuing a STEM career. 
which we have measured using binary variables based on students' interests in multiple STEM fields on the FROST survey. We are then looking at which one has a stronger association in predicting a student interest to go into STEM career. Uh, so we are using the following frameworks to understand student identity and its interaction with others. Highlighting and leaning on these theories helps us to break apart student identity and see differences that might, might come up between our various variables. We're looking at the science identity framework, which we previously talked about, looking at looking glass self theory, where self-concept is formed by how others in our environment see us and how well we perceive those reflections. We're also looking at group socialization theory, where individual peer groups instead of families shape interests and beliefs. And then we're also looking at something called identities in practice, where one's identity is constantly emerging and chase, changing based on the learning environment that one is in, the knowledge gained, and the history of the self that one embodies. Finally, we're using performativity theory, where you are reacting and reflecting to those around you, which forms who you are and what you do. In our literature review, we found various studies that talk about the um, perceptions that family, friends, and teachers have on student interest to pursue a STEM career. We've used a lot of the previous research to build our control variables. So based on the questions off the Frost survey, previous research, and the theoretical framework, our research question is, which STEM I reflected identity has a high, higher relative strength in predicting a student's interest to pursue a career in STEM. To answer our question, we did a logistic regression predicting whether a student would be interested in a career in STEM or not based on family, friend, in school, and out of school teacher reflected identities and various controls. We built three models. The first model we built was just on the controls, which we accounted for gender, race, and Hispanic ethnicity immigration history, parental education level, and career type, and who, if anyone, encouraged students to pursue STEM. The second model we built was the controls and the reflected identity questions. And the third model we built was the controls, reflected identity, and a question of overall STEM identity, where the question is, I, do I see myself as a STEM person? In our first model, we see our baseline odds are a four to one chance of a student not pursuing a STEM, STEM, or the, not pursuing a career in STEM. Men have an 86 percent higher likelihood of pursuing a career in STEM. Asian or Pacific Islander non-Hispanic students have a 27 percent chance higher association of pursuing a career in STEM. Black non-Hispanic students have 84% less likelihood. Students born outside the US have a 20% higher chance. And um, encouragement to pursue a career in STEM has a strong association coming from both family, friends, and teachers. Teachers, family having the highest, followed by teachers and then friends. Now in model two, when we add in our reflected identities, we, we see a big improvement in our baseline odds, which have gone from four to one to three to one odds of a student not pursuing a career in STEM. Men are now 68% more likely to pursue a career in STEM. Asian and Pacific Islander non-Hispanic students are 24% more likely. African American, black non-Hispanic students are 83% less likely. Students born outside the US are 16% more likely. And um, encouragement has been roughly cut in half, but it's still significant. And with our reflected identity questions, we family has the highest positive association in students pursuing a career in STEM, followed by friends. In school and out of school teachers show no positive association for students being interested in a STEM career. However, I want to explicitly stress that encouragement is, has still a positive association coming from teachers. When we add in our final model using overall identity, which we added to see if there was 
an effect above and beyond just a student's identity, where we kind of used the self-identity as an overall control. So here we see that our controls are roughly the same. Our family and friends has decreased, but family is still has the highest positive association, followed by friends, and encouragement to pursue STEM is still significant. So what does this mean? What are the implications? So we found that reflected identity has an effect on career interest beyond its influence on student STEM identity as a whole. It becomes almost an unmediated effect that goes beyond and beyond where family and friends influence a student to pursue a career in STEM. The other implication that we found that while teacher reflected identity doesn't have a significant effect, teacher encouragement does. So we look at this as active versus passive encouragement, where if I encourage my students and say like, I, you should pursue a STEM career, they have more of a chance to do that than me just thinking that they will or doing something passively. I want to thank you all and thanks the posse and does anybody have any questions? Back to your last slide. Yeah. Uh, no, the, the model. So model. Yeah. One more. Yeah. 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 Can you say a little bit more about what you think um, encouragement means from teachers versus reflected identity from um, yes, uh, so I think I view encouragement as stuff that's vocally done, um, whereas reflected identity is more perception based. And um, can I show you a model that we built to talk more about refle what reflected identity is? And then I'll go back. So um, just to kind of show more about what reflected identity is, where so you, you have an action, and then the teacher or your family or friends makes a model of your behavior, and they react back to it. And you perceive their actions, and then you make a model of that. And then make a model of you making a model. So in that sense, like I see like encouragement as something that's more actively done in the classroom and maybe even through like getting students involved in after school things or giving them more STEM material and where reflected identities is more something that's internalized that could be from other factors too. So it's, 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 it's the difference between teachers explicitly doing something like saying you should, you should go into engineering or you should go into science versus the student thinking my teacher thinks of me as a STEM person. Exactly. So these are two, you've separated these two things that most people just sort of put together. Yeah. So, so your, what would your advice be to teachers who, um, what's the responsibility of the teacher uh, in, in that situation? Um, I think to actively, if you want your students to go into STEM, into a STEM career, like at more active encouragement. And then I would also think about what kind of effect you could have on the influencers in the student's life that do have a positive association in reflected identities. So what does that look like? How can teachers have an influence to get family and friends to build this kind of model in students or with each other? Thank you. I like these very sophisticated. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There was a big discussion of whether or not this should be shown. <laughs> but it was on Jackie, and I think we're figuring it out. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Uh, next we have Gina.
Gina is a master candidate in the International Education Policy Program from Harvard Graduate School of Education. And her research interests are in the area of inclusive education, early childhood education, and STEM education. She aims to explore the role of social conditions and different learning experiences in understanding student outcome. Um, yeah, welcome, Gina. So today, wait, is it uh, today I want to talk about who are the students with high interest in STEM that do not pursue STEM careers. So according to statistics from 2010, less than 50% of college graduates in the United States who receive the highest degree in the STEM field choose to pursue STEM or STEM related occupations. So what's happening to more than 50% of the students? And um, this discrepancy can happen as early as pre-college. So previous study um, looked, uh, used students' major in STEM as proxy for career interest. And also, cultivating students' interest in STEM was understood as a way to encourage them to pursue STEM careers. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of research focused on okay, what are the factors associated with um, students' STEM interest. Um, but, well, it is... Partly true, but there's also cases that students study interest in STEM do not directly map onto their career choice. So we want to understand this discrepancy using uh, the key framework of social cognitive career theory. And SCCT proposes a different variables that influence um, both study interest and career interest. Um, personal inputs as gender, race, ethnicity, self-efficacy, and personal belief, for example, um, if I pursue STEM career, what will happen? Um, and environmental factors, which includes learning experiences or interactions with mentors or whether they receive any encouragement from any of the stakeholders, including parents, teachers, and uh, peers. So our research question again is about who are the students with high study interest in STEM that do not have STEM career interests and what are the factors associated with this? And we used the first survey as Chen explained and uh, what distinguished our study from uh, previous study is that we differentiated academic and career interests and asked students directly about their career interests and also explored um, using SCCT framework about student self-efficacy, personal experiences, STEM learning experiences, and interactions with different stakeholders that could potentially predict students' career interests when controlling for STEM learning interest. So who are the students with high interest in learning STEM? And uh, we, we consider students as having high learning interests if they said four, uh, if they reported four or five among any of the subjects in science, mathematics, engineering, and computing. And it was um, among the full sample, 62.7% of the students who reported high um, learning interest in STEM. And among the students, 80% um, answered uh, questions related to uh, their STEM career interest. And among the students who answered, 51% uh, said they don't have uh, STEM career interest. And 49% says they do have STEM career interest. So um, our outcome variable is this two group, one with high STEM learning interest and career interest, and second group with high STEM learning interest with no career interest. And our predictors were um, um, whether a lot of any any of the like stakeholder encouraged them to either pursue STEM or to pursue non-STEM careers, or um, like family engagement, or did they support attending students to STEM programs, or arranging them for out-of-school STEM programs, or did they help students any experiences with family, and if they did it with friends, and then we averaged this to make a composite for informal learning experience with friends. And also we looked into uh, career-related activities, um, whether they participated in any internship, job shadowing activities, um, career days, um, or like competition, did they participate in any of the STEM-related competitions? So these were like all the variables that had significant um, association. Um, and then I used the multiple imputation and logistic regressions. And I will just go through some of the key points. 
So everything was reported in odd ratio for this. And first, personal beliefs have a significant, um, has statistically significant association with students' career interest. Um, so if they value like um, new or having time with uh, family or friends for or themselves, it had positive association with their STEM career interests. Um, but then if they valued um, some interpersonal relationship or um, some like material or external um, reverse, then it was negatively associated with STEM career interest. And um, encouragement was uh, really important in a sense that if they receive um, encouragement to select STEM career, like from high, um, from high school teachers and friends or family, it was positively associated, and also it was uh, like second and like third largest um, had the second or third is uh, magnitude, um, and also school counselor is negative is because it was um, on encouragement to select non STEM career, so it's. Uh, school counselor encouraged them to select non-STEM career. It was uh, the mo it had the actually strongest negative association with those so students um, not like to pursue career interest. And family and friend engagement was also important. So if they receive family support um, or if they had informal activities with friends, then it was positively associated. But then if they received help uh, in their STEM homework, then it was negatively associated with their STEM career interest. And formal learning experiences, um, including uh, taking AP courses and calculus A, B, and B, C, and physics were possibly associated with STEM career interest, uh, while, um, and attending single sex program was uh, the predictor that has the strongest, uh, strongest positive association with STEM career interest. But then um, school type, which is like private school, had negative association with uh, their career interest. And participation in career-related activity had negative relation with um, their STEM career interest. Yeah, sadly. So implications. So we kind of hypothesis that these differences and learning differences uh, in learning interests and career interests could be a precursor to the differences um, they see in adulthood, and also like positive STEM experiences, interactions with family, friends, and educators are really important. So creating STEM learning important for students is important, but then um, helping homework is more like you actually taking out of their opportunities to learn themselves. So it was. was that's why I interpret it as having negative association. And more encouragement for students to pursue careers that they are interested in is very important. And students may associate STEM careers as occupation with low material or interpersonal value, which might have to be addressed. And for future uh, research, um, I kind of recommend doing further uh, on interaction of effect of gender or race or outcome, uh, or all those personal beliefs or um, to actually understand what's going on with those career-related activities that was actually negatively associated with their um, STEM uh, career interest. Thank you. Can you just go back one slide? I just want to uh, that. What kind of career? Related? So it was about um, whether they participate, uh, participate uh, in internships, job shadowing, and uh, work or volunteer for any STEM related settings, uh, or they participated in career um, um, fairs. Yeah, those variables. So this is this is what it's really going to be like. Maybe I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Can I? Yeah. There was one other thing I just wanted to check my understanding on, which is the if a school counselor says you should pursue a career in the arts. Yeah. You're. That's a significant. Negative correlation with pursuing instead. Yes. Okay.
Thank you. So they're doing a good job. job. Just got it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and and the single sex result. Uh -huh. uh, that was for all students, so we you haven't Nailed. looked at the interaction yet whether it, whether it was it was positive for all. Mm -hmm. So it just it may mean that that uh, boys involved with all boy activities mm -hmm. and uh, may be the dominant mm -hmm. issue there. And until mm -hmm. you do the interaction, you don't know yeah. if it affects girls yeah. uh, differently than boys. Yes. Yes, and as, do you have a breakdown of people who went to single gender schools between boys and girls, what the effect was, like separating? Together? I don't have it yet, but I'm definitely looking into that. Thank you for the suggestion. Cool. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Uh, next, we have a legendary. Shana comes from the Education Policy Management Program from Harvard's Graduate School of Education. And uh, her research interests focus on black girls, STEM education, and policy. As a adjunct professor, she taught elementary and secondary science methods courses, which centered on providing research-based instructional and engagement strategies and assessment techniques to pre-service educators. Let's welcome the channel. Hello. Uh oh. Will it not let me go back? Okay. So we don't get to see the title slide. That's okay. Um, <laughs> so my presentation is actually about um, looking at what type of STEM and out of school uh, interventions help. Uh, black girls go into or have interest in STEM careers. And so why is this important? For me, I was a K-12 uh, high school science teacher for a very long time. Um, and in that process, I ran into a lot of students who I was their first black teacher. Um, also, uh, whether they were black students or white students, um, and us having conversations afterwards and students saying that they, are, they were going to go into uh, chemistry or biology uh, because they had some a role model or a teacher that kind of looked like them and they realized that they could do it. So it kind of sparked my interest in this. Um, but then there's also this movement by uh, National Science Foundations and other granting uh, bodies that are trying to, uh, states and federal governments that are putting money into STEM programs uh, that are targeting marginalized communities um, and like Latinx and African American uh, communities. And so I wanted to see what type of uh, factors would help move students, uh, specifically African American girls, um, toward a STEM career. Um, so improving, uh, why is this important for society or for anyone who wants to put money into this? Uh, improving the return on the investment of these types of STEM in, in, uh, Interventions is super important. Uh, if schools are going to put money into after school programs or states, they're going to want to see if what they're doing is actually working. Um, how do you improve the quality of the STEM workforce by having a much larger talent pool? And um, we know that there are not a lot of women, and especially a lot of African American women. And so, how do we increase that diversity? And so, of course, when you increase diversity, it brings new perspectives and pro uh, to problem solving. Um, so the one thing that I want to talk about is the definition for STEM. Uh, the traditional definition that we talk about uh, is usually physical science, life science, math, engineering, uh, computer science, and information science. Uh, the National Science Foundation actually adds an additional piece to that. Theirs is also social and behavioral science, which includes psychology, uh, economic sociology, and political science. Um, and that becomes so how we defined uh, STEM is by using this definition. And that also becomes very important specifically for our population and what we found. So if we take a look at um, kind of the numbers. So uh, we used iPads data to kind of take a look at where are girls falling uh, in college for their uh, degree interest. And so for non-black girls, there's about 18% that fall in social science. But if you look, black girls are overrepresented in this particular area of social science. 
um, traditional STEM, uh, 8.27 for black girls, and then uh, 11.4, and then again, an overrepresentation a little bit for girls who fall into the health field for black girls, 18.8, .8, and then 17.53. Over here with our data set, our black girls, if you look, the first two, social science and traditional, we're going to be combining for our definition of STEM. So we have about 21%. And if you see those two don't quite add up, it's because uh, those categories were not uh, exclusive, meaning that someone could click more than one box. So we had about 10% of our sample that did that. Um, we have about 35% of the black girls in our sample that were interested in both health and medicine. Um, and then for non-STEM, Across the bottom, it's about 41%. So I put this slide here because I think it's important to have a conversation about how I defined black girls, uh, which is a little bit different from the data set that I just, uh, iPads that we talked about. Um, yes, anyone who selected black was included, but the additional piece is the Afro-Latinas that usually get left out. And so in addition to if you selected Hispanic and black, you were also included in this data set as well, which a lot of times they are not included in this data set. So out of about 15,000 uh, participants, for ours, we had 900 students who fell into this category. All right. The effective interventions for black girls. So looking at the literature review, there are quite a few things that were listed there. A couple of things which you would expect, academic preparedness, um, identity development, confidence, uh, expectations, ability. But these are some other things that were listed, which was mother's education, STEM intervention conditions, such things like single sex programs or ones that are much more hands on. Uh, and then also systems of support. Who are their mentors? Who are their teachers? Um, and then opportunities for STEM programs. So do they even have access to these particular types of programming? Um, what we did when we, when we had got this information, which was great and it was wonderful, we had the opportunity and the variables to do this, uh, we decided to run a binomial logistic regression using just a class of STEM and then non-STEM. But when we did that and we used like mother's education and we did these things, we didn't get any significant findings, which is the exact opposite of the literature review. So I spent about a week stressing uh, <laughs> and going back. Uh, but when I went back to the literature, I realized that they were using the term STEM very generally. And so, and it was also kind of being conflated with this idea of going to college. And so with our participants, they're all in college. So that's not an issue here. So what we decided to do was to actually break them up into three classes. So we had a traditional STEM, which is math, engineering, we did our uh, social sciences, and then we did the non-STEM. And when we did this, we got a lot more very interesting information. So two of the most important findings that we found were for mother's education. Um, before I get into that, let's just take a look at this. So on the far left, that's just kind of missing in a data, so we won't pay attention to that, but it's a nice kind of a bell-shaped curve, which you kind of think of where people's parents fall as far as education go. But if you look at the blue lines, as the mother's education goes up, the black girls usually go into other things, which is kind of a little different than what was being said. So it's a nice general trend that kind of exists, which is something to possibly think about and explore later. Um, but the most specific or a significant finding that we found here was that the mother's education actually moves girls toward health and medicine and actually pulls them off of STEM. Okay. Uh, another finding that we found was this idea of role models. And so for role models, um, the significant finding here was that role models gender actually moves girls towards STEM and pulls them off of non-STEM careers. And so if you take a look across the bottom here, um, on the far left, uh, you'll see that there's black women. And then on, this, on the right, there's black men. And the center, just in general, uh, most of these girls have mostly white male mentors, or next to that, they don't have an, a mentor at all, um, which we could explore for, I'm sure that's for a lot of different reasons, especially we're talking about a STEM field that's still not very diverse. That kind of makes sense. Um, but I also want to take a look at where it says white women and black men, because if you notice, there's not much of a pattern there. And so when we look at black women, 
Um, one plus one does not equal two. And so that's kind of this idea, idea of like intersectionality of both gender and race for black women or black girls. So for women, uh, it's great to have a woman of any race um, that will kind of help move you towards STEM. Um, but if you look at black women, we also see another kind of trend here, which is going toward, you know, lots of health and medicine, which again, may have a lot to do with what we've seen before. All right. um, and then, why does this even matter? What, what can we use? What can we do with this information? Well, things to consider. If you're creating a STEM program, you need to be very intentional about what you're creating and what you're defining as STEM. So there's black girls that code. That's very specific. That's a STEM-centered uh, program. Um, are you doing engineering? Are you trying to move girls towards medicine and health? Whereas uh, math and engineering and science is more of the traditional STEM. And then what else can we do when you're creating these programs? Uh, create, having instructors or mentors that are, have the same gender as, as the girl, or also female as the girls. Um, and then also possibly a parental uh, involvement or engagement piece as well. Uh, talking to parents, just letting them know uh, the opportunities and everything that exists in that particular field. And that's it. Um, in your <clears throat> definitions for your study, mm -hmm. I didn't see which category health fell in. Was was it the social science or the yes? Um, and so it'll uh, so and health and medicine is that separate so, from those? Yes. Yeah, so on the first slide, if you'll look here, um, the reason why we were able to separate the idea of kind of health. Um, for us is because we were able to ask the girls if they want to go into health or medicine. For the other two, it was more of their uh, degree, and so there's not really a health degree. They usually end up either in a social science or biology. Um, and so here, when we, th um, when we think about where the girls want to go, health or medical field fell in the social behavioral science for us. and computer science from uh, Harvard College and she's currently a PhD student uh, from uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education. So I come from a background in statistics, and now I'm doing research in education, so here we are, it's statistics education. And so my big question for this study is, who takes statistics in high school? What do we know about these people? Um, and so I'm kind of phrasing it, it's entirely kind of descriptive and exploratory. Um, characterizing the backgrounds and interests of statistics takers using a national sample of college freshmen, the FROST data. So quickly first, I'm going to just bring you through kind of the growth and the history of statistics education to set the scene a little with a quiz, one item quiz. How many students do we think took AP Stat exam in 2018? And I'm not going to throw you in entirely blind. We've got a few numbers for context of numbers taking other AP subject exams. So stare at this for a minute and then I'll gather about three guesses. Um, before I reveal the answer. 10,000? 10, 10, huh? 40,000, 40, yeah. 100,000, sure. 80,000, yeah. 8? 222,000! It is a very large number, and, and um, as I expected and hoped, uh, it is larger than many people kind of have in their heads. Um, also, so this is just AP statistics exam takers. 
the actual number of students in statistics courses in high schools is actually significantly larger than this. So in our FROST data, 11% of students said that they had taken AP statistics in high school, but a total of 26% of them, so more than double, said that they've taken some statistics in college, so like a non-AP course, or maybe um, there's plenty of people who take AP classes but don't sit exams. So yeah, possibly on the order of 500,000 is my ballpark. Um, this is based on college uh, freshmen, then there's also people who don't end up in college. But yes, large number, very important population, about whom not all that much is known. And so we also see that it is now in ninth overall out of AP subjects, despite being of all 38 AP subjects, it was the 31st to be introduced. So it was very late to the game. Sorry, it's kind of snuck in here between um, biology and human geography. So ninth overall in terms of exam taking, but of the STEM fields, so sciences, mathematics, it's now in third place, uh, just in behind biology and AB calculus. So again, like more people than you would think. Uh, and so then kind of some framing the story so far as I see it. Um, statistics as a field has emerged relatively recently. So if I'm situating what my work is compared to things like mathematics education and science education, mathematics and science have been going on for a little longer. Uh, statistics in the form that we see it today, I would have it emerging early to mid 20th century. Um, there's some things going on before then, but were really significant things that I think are huge kind of bread and butter of what we use nowadays appear around about this time. Uh, statistics education comes along a little later in kind of a widespread form. Um, so the very first university statistics department, University College London, 1911. Um, other big departments catch up in the sort of the mid 20th century. Oh, we've got a little bit of a cutoff here, so I can read it out here. Um, in 1994, somewhat significant, um, statistical reasoning as a skill is now required in the SAT exam. And 1996 is when we first see AP statistics, and it's grown enormously since then. Um, but yes, very recent. And then statistics education research, that's like just barely got off the ground. So we've got two journals in this field um, that I think are most of note. Uh, statistics education research journal and the journal of statistics education, both at the end of the 20th century. So just it's a very new field and all of this is kind of new. People are still figuring out who is taking statistics and why. Um, in case you think that I might be cherry picking these dates, this is a little Google Ngrams trend plot. So Google Ngrams tells you the frequency of words in the huge corpus of books that Google has scanned. Statistics we see has really kind of grown over the 20th century, but statistics education has come along a little later. So. Basically, you're all caught up. We, <laughs> plenty of students are taking statistics. We think that's probably for a range of reasons. Um, certainly, it's required for a real range of college majors and careers nowadays, from biology and computer science to you know business and physics and all sorts of things. Uh, so yeah, who are these people? Why do they seem to be taking statistics? Um, I'm using the Frost's data, and I'm including the 4,000 students who said that they took statistics or AP statistics. And then I'm just kind of exploring. So I'm using uh, latent profile analysis, which is looking at groups of students with similar profiles. Uh, if you have any background in cluster analysis, it's a similar idea of trying to look. In this two-dimensional case, it's grouping things that look very similar to each other and calling that a cluster or a profile. Um, mine will be a nine-dimensional space, so we won't get a pretty picture, but we can talk about what's going on. Uh, here are the predictors that I'm throwing in. Uh, I've chosen two of those kind of career values, uh, making money and helping people. Uh, we've also got interest in math as they report from the uh, end of middle school. Uh, then I've also got the highest, or the, the highest English language arts course they took in high school, the grade that they report that they got, uh, their total SAT scores, uh, their STEM identity, which was you know, with other people have presented on them, there are 17 items. I just took the average. It was great. Uh, and then the career uh, items, of which I think there were something like 22. I've followed the uh, international standard classification of occupations uh, and grouped them under these three headers. There's some that don't make it. Um, but we've got legal, social, and cultural, uh, science and engineering, and health careers. Uh, legal, social, and cultural is everything from 
uh, lawyer, politician, biz uh, no, not business, um, psychologist, sociologist, archaeologist, performing artist, visual artist, science and engineering, there's a whole lot of those, and then health and medicine come into this last category. And so of those, if we've got this nine-dimensional space trying to pull out people who are similar to each other, you get lots of colours, but it's a little bit difficult to pass. But I, I will orient you more to this. Um, we do see that there are kind of differences, that there are real spreads on um, some of these categories more so than others. Uh, and then, yeah, let's get to know... I, I tried a bunch of different class solutions, so everything from, I think, 1 to 12 different classes. Uh, and the evidence points to 8 being the best solution. And so our largest class at the top here, uh, just based on... Uh, for each person in my data set, I've assigned them a probability of falling into any of these eight classes, just picking the highest probability for each person. We get 26% of people in this first class, which sort of scooting along, we see, oh, sorry, context. These are all standardized variables, so I've put them all to have a mean at zero and a standard deviation of one among these 4,000. So we see that they're higher on helping interest, that they're also a little higher on math and ELA, but I think the defining characteristic is that these are the health and medicine kids. And so that, of the statistics takers, we've got a really large portion who seem to be looking at this profile of helping people and going into health or medicine. Next one down, we've got 24%-ish. And going along here, we see a really high math interest, reasonably high English grade, quite high SAT scores, um, also quite high STEM identities, and interest in science and engineering. Um, so this could be people who are interested in science and engineering. They're doing quite well on SATs. They're very interested in math. Um, they're not very interested in money or helping people, but that's <laughs> just all on averages. Uh, next one down, uh, another 21% of people. I think the defining feature of this class is that this is our highest group here, at least in the, in the top three, on um, these uh, other sort of legal, social, cultural careers. Um, they're very low on STEM identity, a little lower on the SATs, higher on the English, very low on math interest, but they really want to help people. Um, so these are people, yeah, they're taking statistics, but they don't actually much like math, or they're not very interested in it. Um, and they're hoping to go into a non-STEM, non-health career. Um, working our way down, we've got a few smaller ones. This one is very interested in making money. Um, good on them. And then they are not interested in any of these careers. A couple of items that I didn't include in these groups are things like business or um, athletics or things like that. So there are just limitations into how many things I can fit in and make it make sense. Um, and then further down the line, yeah, we can kind of just talk about and describe different profiles of these students, of who are the people who are taking statistics and get a bit of a sense of the diversity among them. Um, that's my presentation. Those are people that picked that they went, they were taking statistics. Were any of them also taking calculus? Yeah, so that's another, uh, that's the next stage of my uh, research is to split it up into um, calculus takers, statistics takers, both and neither. And I've looked at these four categories along a couple of different um, dimensions. For the most part, we see that the differences among them are smallish. Um, but I think the calculus takers look a lot like the both takers, uh, and the statistics takers look more like the neither takers. So that's kind of the broad trends that I've been seeing. I'm hoping to look further into it. I'm also hoping to, once I've now got these classes, say things like, um, if you took AP statistics, am I more likely to put you into class one? Or of people in class four, are they like calculus takers or no? Um, so now that we've got these classes, then kind of correlating with those other variables is going to be interesting. But yeah, great question. Why did you plan yeah. business? Um, so the way that I implemented this latent, latent profile analysis, it wanted all of my variables to be continuous. So putting in a binary variable was going to make it throw an error. Um, I can look into doing this in another program, but business I had difficulty grouping with any other similar career, or at least according to the International Labour Organization thing. Uh, and then also, yeah, because we had our career interests as binary, not as degrees of interest, I just kind of a data limitation there. But I can definitely look, ha, look at how it correlates with these. Yeah. Can, can you go back to your graph? Mm-hmm. 
So this is a little simpler way. This isn't the like glass analysis. This is just this is. This is? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is like class two down here has very low oh, English I see, scores. I see. Yeah. So this isn't like a logistic regression or anything. This is um, kind of the precursor to the table that I showed you. I it's see. pretty, but it's not very easy to pass. But it yeah. shows like making money. There's not mm -hmm. much difference. Um, yeah. The, yeah. Making uh, money. Uh, we don't see that. That uh, kind of looking down the column, we do see some differences. So I think, yeah, partly it's that the latent profile analysis didn't mostly split people on the making money. Partly I think it's also, um, so this science and engineering uh, variable for one, um, like this is like five standard deviations above the mean. Um, and I think that's partly because of the way I constructed it is that there are nine binary items of whom I'm summing. So a lot of people will be around zero, one, and two, and some number of people will be up around seven, eight, and nine. And so standardizing it is going to make things look a little weird because even though there's so many, so much mass is around zero, that the standard deviation might not be very wide, but there are some people who are very high. So I think it's partly just the scale that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. I think this is more informative, but I'm going to look at ways to visualize it better as I move forward. Right, but if we could go back to the graph. <laughs> yeah. <sorry. laughs> looking at where there's not much spread, like the SAT total yeah, and the STEM identity. So it's not like STEM identity is predicting which class that they're in. Um, uh, maybe maybe well, also, this is a very small scale, so like we've got between sort of negative one and one standard deviations. I see. Like, but I think because we've had to zoom out to show these ridiculous engineering kids, um, <laughs> This just looks a little smaller than it might otherwise so, be. Yeah. Can you tell whether they're engineering kids or science geeks? Like in your, if you yeah, that's actually a really good question, but I'll look into that. Thank you. Because they're different kinds of attitudes. Yeah, so the, um, the, the nine items that are grouped together under the um, classification I used included things like biologist, chemist, physicist, and also engineer. Just the engineer, I think. I don't know if there are different kinds of engineering. Uh, so yeah, we'll look into that. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think you know, from my own kids and other kids I've known, I mean, there are sort of these three groups. There are the kids who take statistics mm -hmm. but no calculus, yeah. and people who take calculus but no statistics, mm -hmm. and people who take them both, and Absolutely. people who take neither. Yeah. So a lot of kids who take uh, AP statistics or statistics in high school are sort of avoiding calculus. Totally, yeah. yeah. And so I think, um, and the sort of stat calc, both neither analyses that I've briefly looked at, mm -hmm. that would maybe describe, like, be a good explanation for why the statistics takers look more similar to the neither than the both or the calculus. Probably just math interest and avoidance and things like that. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, hopefully we'll get Six staff funded, and we'll get to continue. Absolutely, it's a work in progress. <laughs> Great. Pizza's on the way. It's going to be a few more minutes. So, so general, your general question. Now that we're waiting for pizza, we can open to questions. Or, 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 any comments from you all? Any comments or questions for any of the five presenters? Can we find the papers for these somewhere? Or is there in preparation? Oh, okay, these papers? Yeah. Yes. In preparation. That's, <laughs> that's their, uh, yeah, that's their work. Uh, it's try to finish it and keep working on it and get it published. Are you, in the meantime, can we find the slides somewhere? The slides? No. Uh, I'm going to share it some, somewhere. Well, I think until they publish, they probably don't want to share the slides. Yeah. Well, I think 
I think it really depends on the, the presenters. Okay. Uh, if you ask any one of us, okay. maybe someone can just send you the email. So I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about the, this is all for us. This is the first time we had everybody working on one data set. So I really love all the different questions. No, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but the, the, the data set came before your, was just presented to you, it came before your, your, your questions and your analysis. So I'm wondering what, what things did we miss in the data set? What data would you have wanted in addition to what you got? Would, would there have, did we miss some questions which would have been useful to you? I actually had, in addition to like the career interest part, I, I would have liked the option of like other STEM like career. Because right now they have like, they can choose whether they're interested in any of the other like non-STEM career, but then there's no option for like STEM careers, but that, that is not listed. Mm -hmm. So which makes um, them like, I'm not sure whether like, yeah. I see, okay. And for me, I would like also um, status about disability that's possible. Um, about disability? Disability, whether they have a certain disability or what they have. Hmm. That would be interesting to have yeah, as a demographic for students. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Other, other, any, anybody else would say what, what else? Would we have gotten better, thanks to Jackie, at some of the points we asked questions since the survey. We, we do better with gender, we do better with mm -hmm. um, race. So I'm, I'm sure, sure you're, I think. I'm not sure how to translate my disability question into like the five point. Um, yeah. yeah, 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 disability is hard to. Seven select all the reply, which is lots of options for five. But I, I think that's very important to us. So we should figure out which part of the survey. Anything else? Lots more does not apply. <laughs> Rather than just assuming they, right. when they don't like answer. There, there isn't a response in here assuming that they intentionally need to know whether they're choosing not to answer it to be able to distinguish this and get yeah. better. There's quote loads of assumptions built in um, that aren't even the same between every variable. A lot of us use about um, the career values, and then we did all like um, kind of exploratory, but that it would have been nice if it was we can do like CFA instead, like kind of like, have certain like, questions that leads to like um, people um, instead of because sometimes our like category was kind of weird. Like, is it okay to say that actually we need time? Like, so the country. Pre-grouping questions yeah. in the survey itself. Yeah. Like, these three questions are asked about this, yes. and the students would see that grouping. Yeah. There's one other thing I'm curious about, and I don't know how to quantify it at all, and that is peer influences, because they're pretty strong. Um, uh, staying in STEM. Um, Or how 
whether they feel that they're part of some community. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I, I or whether they're peers. isolated as the only person. Right. So, um, because it takes a certain amount. Of, I have friends who are like the only one in their math classes in college, and mm -hmm. um, specifically some of them major statistics and urban ethics. And so, you know, staying through takes a certain amount of. If, if you don't have support, it's a little different than if you do. Somewhat similar to Roy's media question, did and all of these informal things around was it your idea to sign up or you to do this or 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 did somebody suggest you do this? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, when they were available, we did have yeah. for the informal like, for a lot of the informal activities, but yes. it was available for you, right. but not for the. High school course. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. There's lots of not availability. Yeah. yeah. But but we had to change our interpretation of the question because the students read a different given than that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so we should fix that question if we wanted to read how we intend. Um, we asked uh, if you were you were unable to take any um, like STEM activity or program. Please list like why and then a bunch of options. But it appears that students interpreted that as if there was at least one activity you couldn't do, tell us about why you couldn't, mm. as opposed to if you were unable to do literally any. Like if you were if you had zero access, because they, they would tell us the reasons they couldn't do stuff and tell us all the stuff so they did. Like, uh, right. <laughs> 30% of you are doing things that you can't have access to what you're doing. Um, so we still have fantastic data from that, but we didn't we didn't answer, we didn't get answers like we expected. Um, so we would have to ask you different things to really measure um, this sort of full access sort of thing. Because we can have a different concept of access with different questions.
looks like she left. Okay. Wasn't she the one that had like they're all negative effects for, for an African male? Like it's like there's no promise in those statistics. At least her analysis. I think so. Every every category seems to have no effect. They're all negative predictors for the average I'm pretty sure. One of the earlier presentations. So I know in Jenny's we found that being a Yeah. 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 Yeah.
points about the survey and like timings and whatnot that can twist like 180 degrees with a very like precise versus imprecise reading of the item. Um, it's also like this would be very different if it's any member of the family versus your parent. Because if you have a sibling who just took the class the previous year, you're much more likely to ask them for help about something than your parents may have decades ago. And they may just hand you, like, here's the <laughs> answers, therefore you want to know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It also could help me, and I went to them, it's a different thing, right? Like, knowing that somebody in my family is capable and has the content knowledge to help me versus, like, I, was, I was struggling and I had to go through the help or two different. What's the question on the survey that I just can't remember? Right. Do we have that memorized? I haven't done stuff for that question. <laughs> 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 I don't remember charity So you throw it back and say, no, you have a <laughs> <mask, laughs> <you try study. laughs> And she found that the, um, she saw a, a difference between, uh, um, a difference between black students and non-black students. Black students and white students have to get that experience. And she found that the, the, the the, the difference between their performance in college um, was uh, significant, but it disappeared when you added in whether they could get help with their math or the, 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 the difference between the students who might be struggling um, in math was that they could get the white students that more could get more help at home. Um, I remember that she made that gender gap disappear. Yeah. By, and that was the by, critical. By adding stuff. By adding variables. That was the critical variable. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that. I think she added several other things. Like, I don't think it was just this one really. But in the end, we can answer. Yeah. It just found the homework question. So, <laughs> which of the following statements describe your family's interest in and attitudes towards STEM mark all that apply? And the statement is, someone could help me with STEM homework. 21% of people agree. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be a bit No. So I was really interested since she had to run back and teach. Um, <laughs> yeah. The, the teachers. Yeah. We've talked about before about the difference between actually, and those are two different questions on the survey for anybody who, you know, about the, if you feel like you're, you know, you know, if, if yeah. teacher recognizes you as a STEM person, right? Did your teacher support you in pursuing, right. and encourage you? And, and, it, and it wasn't a yes, no, it was, one, it was again one of those questions where who, who encouraged you when you could bring all these different people in? Right. The teacher was one of them. Yeah. Oh, that's OST. Yeah, um, we didn't include a counselor in that definition of teacher, mm -hmm. um, which seems especially important given uh, your like encouraged to go on the sense of driving people away from STEM. Um, mm -hmm. If we only looked at conversions into STEM, then we would include the did we ask, did anybody discourage you? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Did anybody yeah. look at that? I guess we did. We had encouraged into a career, into a non-step career. So it's, it's encouragement away, not discouragement. Mm -hmm. Different things. They are different yeah. things. Oh, if, if we had something like that, then it would have shown up. Well, it would have shown up. Well, maybe it got dropped in more than a version, but it would have shown up in the what are your family's attitudes towards it, yeah. and they're like, screw them. And that was like <laughs> one checkbox thing, as opposed to like, the five different family members who could have been merged. But I don't remember it in there. No. But that, that means is there's the encourage, and there's seeing as a Right. So that means. There are these four categories. They could both be true, both be false. Or what does it mean for a teacher, for a student to say, my teacher saw me as a STEM person. It's that drawing. But did that not encourage me? 
Right, that's what she said happened, right? That it was only significant if you actively. If they, you go through this. If you said, yeah. It encourages the way Right. Thanks all. Thank you. 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 I think it's the teacher at some point tells the student, I think you should be a chemist. Mm -hmm. That's encouragement. Um, the other one is more a psychological or mm -hmm. socialization right. thing. Like she mentioned the uh, people are self. Do you mm -hmm. notice the, yeah. the, the, the year? 1902. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's a, it's a basic sociological th thing that we are able to read uh, subtle things. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. People don't have to say anything to you. And you will make a judgment whether they see you as a STEM person or not. Mm -hmm. But it could also include stuff like, wow, you're so good at science. That's not encouragement for, to pursue a career in STEM, but it does help build the idea that they see you. Mm -hmm. Like the grading people. Right. Mm -hmm. that, like, you didn't name chemistry. Or if they ask for feedback in class and they look to you. Yeah. Right. Well, well, or, 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 your, or your peers look to you right. yes, right. as as mm -hmm. someone that has a valued input or someone that can right. bring something to the discourse versus you know the deer in the headlights look. And so these are all ways that build that. Idea in your head that when people see you as something that are missing that explicit like call to action. Right. When the teacher looks up and he's looking right at you or you and bypassing you for initial glances. Yeah, I think that is. It, it's tremendously, I mean, this uh, people are very good at reading these uh, signals. Right. And it doesn't have to be even verbal. No, it's just. Uh, I mean, there was this, this famous million in the classroom study about Rosenthal, mm -hmm. uh, where they randomly told the teacher these are good students, mm -hmm. and it wasn't true. I mean, they were the good students. Mm -hmm. they, they take their subtle messages <laughs> because it's kind of the ethos of the teacher that you don't go around and tell the class. A Harvard professor told me that you are the good students. Like, and I'm dealing with you, and the others just sit there and be quiet. That's not how they did it. I think they probably felt they were fair right. to each of the students. This impartiality yeah. facade, but, but their but actions. They were fair, tried to be as fair as they wanted, as they could. The students picked up the opinion that these teachers falsely had acquired about the students. Mm -hmm. So, so I think this is the difference. Like seeing me as a STEM person, that could have come from all sorts of tiny little signals. Encouragement is very much straightforward. Like, did this teacher ever tell me, well, you should check out this kind of major, you should check out this kind of career, and then the same. Or, or you should take advanced math next term, or you should go to the AP course next. Certainly. See, that's the way for schools. <clears throat> schools are structured that way. I mean, kids are tracked, and so once you're in sort of the track, and you're going to take calculus. Uh, then you also have a certain part in your schedule where you have time for physics, AP, or chemistry AP. And if you wanted to do like an arts major and do chemistry AP, you can't do that because the school's day is not set up that way because there's so few students who do it. So they, they tend to have these blobs of students who march Culture together, right? And that, that's a really big problem for kids who like are interested in arts but want to do math too or something else. Which sort of goes to um, the idea of Emma's point about the, the items I'm like, could take the class um, versus was unable to even know what was offered. Um, so like, your school may have it, but because of those conflicts and the fact that you were doing you know, a senior thesis in your art class, during the time that AP stats happen, like, you, can't, you can't get into it now. Or if you're in a college major and you don't take the prerequisite your freshman year, you miss out too. And or you do badly on the prerequisite and you have to take it again, you fall behind, you decide you're to have withstand the something else. So I think the structural problems, if we could 
study those and sort of eliminate those and find out what things you can actually fix um, with a small investment and then start fixing those and then start creating the demand to fix the big things too. Or maybe the other way, fix the big things. <laughs> 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 I have a feeling the big things are going to be hard to fix. The, 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 all these students who are interested in STEM as a subject but don't want to stand for mm -hmm. and that's, 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 <laughs> like, like what's happening there? They don't see STEM as, um, as something in their future is being caused wanting to make more money or being interested in people and, and they don't see STEM as having anything to do with people and it's going to be a slog and you're not going to make any money. Um, in any career, aspirational program kills that instantly. Yes. Confirms any notion of a STEM career. But a lot of the things that we were looking at too should be your next thing, but all these different variables of I like to look at the stars, I like to do this, I like to do that, or I, you know, even the, the structured and non structured ones. A lot of those, the intent uh, may, as it is with some of our things, we're not trying to build a million scientists. It's a few, if we get a few, that's good, but you know, there's lifelong learning us, and we don't. So the people who don't want to go into STEM career might still be, you know, have a lifelong interest in science and want to do sciencey things, but just not for a Job. Yeah, so that should be counted as a success case. Right. So, so yeah. what I'm saying, so the people running the programs who we're talking back to, like the museum people, the, the, in the informal learning world, right? We call right. that. They want to know: <laughs> yeah. Do they still have a no, STEM identity right. in that? Right. In that freshman year, even though they, right, don't aren't pursuing a STEM career, mm -hmm. um, and and STEM. so some some. Study that bears upon that well, would be. So the end is again getting an identity measure early would be super important. I know a lot of the stuff that we were talking about, of like trying to design research questions, anything that held on identity was sort of time locked. It's because that was a college yeah. measure. Right. Yeah. And so it does have to be affect. Something could only point forwards from there. I'm like talking about the stuff in high school or in college. You couldn't say like, oh, I didn't be on beginning high school or something because that's like a retroactive action. Um, so we didn't ask. Do your parents see you when you were in middle school? We don't have no. to, right? Oh, so, okay. so if we can get these measurements, sort of, yeah. And at the very least, like as a kid, and then now, so you have the two points that would help with. Uh, Changes in identity, um, and maybe help clarify some of the like chicken egg issue. Oh yeah, high identity is associated with going to museums. Kind of duh, all the high identity kids are going to here and they're just showing up and enjoying. It. <laughs> right, and so that like our study cannot answer that because we don't have. Yeah, I just wonder about that retrospective nature of like, of remembering whether in yeah, middle school I mean, you, know, you kids, saw kids yourself as a science person. Remember, did you see your grades from middle school to some extent in their freshman in college? And remember what they wanted to be, yeah. but whether they had an identity and how you measure identity retrospectively? Yeah, I mean we have to see yeah, direct still. measure. Yeah. We could say identity is, is linked to, to, interest. to career, to career interest. interest, and we can control for what we have to control longitudinal about the career yeah. interest. But I mean, even 